First cause argument, part two. We're reviewing the book Who Designed the Designer by uh, uh, Agros, I think it's Michael if I remember correctly, uh, Recon A Rediscovered Path to God's Existence. Um, it's available at Kindle and Look if you're trying to hunt it down cheaply. Um, it's an explanation and defense of the argument from causes in general to the first cause and then what kind of a cause it is. And um, if you want other viewpoints on that, uh, you can find a positive viewpoint in the uh, Peter Kreft uh, uh, reference and you can find a negative viewpoint in Rational Wiki. Um, we have talked about the argument to the first cause, is there at least one first cause? We're going to be talking about the properties of the first cause, and then eventually we'll go into philosophical problems with the argument, scientific problems with the argument, which are intertwined with each other, and theological problems with the argument, um, and then finally try to put it in context. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about the properties of the first cause or causes. As it turns out, one of the properties will be singularity. Uh, uh, Dr. Agros has um, established, at least to his own satisfaction, that there is at least one first cause. So now he is going to be arguing that there is at one, most one first cause. He says there cannot possibly be two things, neither of which has a cause of its being. And that's a quote from Thomas Aquinas. And uh, now he's going to give you a, a basis for believing that. Where we see similar physical properties suspect a common cause. Rocks fall on Earth and also on Mars due to one force, not to special earthly forces and quite distinct Martian ones, uh, usually known as gravity. Causal unification happens so often that even when we find strikingly disparate effects, we tend to suspect that a deeper underlying unity will eventually come to light. This has happened with heat, light, sound, and motion, which are all forms of energy, and again with matter and energy, which are somehow equivalent. Countless millions of shockingly different chemical compounds are the offspring of about a hundred elements, and these in turn come out of a handful of subatomic particles, usually felt to be only three, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Perhaps the most amazing unification story of all, if it is indeed true, is that all living things have descended from a single common ancestor. What diversity from that u original unity? Biologists no notice that he's quite friendly to the idea of common ancestry. Um, Biologists noting the flexibility of certain species in the hands of breeders first became convinced that distinct yet recognizably different varieties of some plant or animal living close proximity to one another in the wild must have had the same ancestors. Which is actually true. The kaibab squirrel and the, the one in the south both having tufted. What? Albert squirrel. Uh, and Albertson, it probably came from the same squirrel uh, originally. They began to suspect that even many animals of quite different species, or setting still higher order differences, um, could be traced. I may have mistranslated. I thought I screened this, but I guess not quite carefully enough. Um, could be traced back to the same progenitors. Today, the general similarity of uh, being organisms at all is fast becoming a sufficient reason for inferring that two living things 
derived ultimately from the very same origins, or at least from the origins of the very same time. So that's kind of a quick argument for common descent, but he's actually using it as an argument from common descent. You have common descent, well, you know, they all came from a simple origin. If being an organism is common to two distinct things, some, one reason underlies this, even if we haven't the faintest idea of what it might be. Maybe one of them is the offspring of the other. Maybe they are the descendants of a common ancestor. Maybe they are evolved on different planets altogether. But due to prior similarities in the chemical foundations of life and in the survival traits in which their ancestors were faced, they turned out like two peas in a pod. The thing that I find striking about this is he's obviously offering all kinds of hypotheses. Maybe they had a common designer, but that hypothesis is not there. And that gives you a little bit of an idea of the mindset that we're looking at. As far as the general many from one pattern is concerned, it makes no difference which of these turns out to be the case. Experience has taught us not to be complacent with multitudes of things. There is always some underlying unity. It is a recurrent theme in reality, in art as well as in nature, and even in logic and mathematics. Now, notice what he is doing. He is making an inductive argument. In order to get to premise one, he has to make an inductive argument, which means that it's not really quite as sound as it sounds like. Cosmos, I'm skipping over some stuff. The universe could not be beautiful, though, if it were an unintelligible mess. Uh, cosmos meaning, of course, uh, the universe in, in Greek. Um, which means beauty, and it also means the universe. There must be some governing principle of order inherent in it, and an order is a kind of unity in all things. But how would that come about if there were, not, if there were 42 first causes, all existing and acting independently of each other? We would have a disjointed world. As things are, it seems as though all existing things are cousins. The lesson of the snowball. At first, it might seem impossible to settle the question how many first causes are there without yet knowing in detail what kinds of things first causes are. Remember, his project is to be able to make this from, I guess, what he would call common sense, um, kind of almost necessary, well, he would say necessary uh, propositions. Fortunately, the absolute firstness of a first cause itself provides enough information for us to go on. In a similar way, we don't know what all things are in great detail, but that does not stop us from realizing that there cannot be more than a single all. If there were really 16 alls, any one of them would not really be all, would it? The proof of there being ju just one first cause is a bit hairier. I missed that. Uh, bad dictation. Uh, a bit hairier than that, however, we must familiarize ourselves with a couple of principles first. To begin, we must take full advantage of the universal negation implied in a first cause. There must be at least one first cause that is ultimately, that is absolutely first, depending on no other cause whatsoever for its own causal action, and therefore depending on nothing else for its existence. These negations eliminate many suspects. No beast, tree, or stone can be the first cause, since these things all come about from prior causes. The stars themselves, seemingly immortal, are born and die uh, and are dependent on causes that maintain them for as long as they exist. I remember when I first began to realize that familiar things depend on causes to keep existing and not just to start existing. On the coldest New England days, when the snow was most powdery, I could not make a snow fort or even a snowball. No matter how hard I tried to pack the snow together, it always just came apart in my mittens and blew away in the wind. If bringing things together were a sufficient cause of their staying together as one thing, 
I would have had no trouble making a snowball on those especially cold days. Bringing things together is simply not a sufficient principle of their staying together after you let them be. Even a humble snowball requires more than a mere shaper. It requires parts that can grab each other somehow. In the case of a successful snowball then, there was another agency at work besides that of my hands. Every combination presupposes a combiner. Every combination that comes into existence depends on a combiner to produce it. And every combination that exists depends on a combiner to sustain it. But everything familiar to us is a combination of things. Nothing familiar to us is a first cause then. And so a first cause must be something quite unfamiliar. Is it some purely formless matter underlying all combinations or some entirely indivisible particle? The principle I have been elaborating, that a combination of things implies a pre preservative combiner, is clearest in the case of combinations whose components dislike each other. If two magnets are kissing at their north poles, then something else is holding them together. If a house built out of heavy materials does not come down, something is forcing it to stay up. But it is also true that when things are merely indifferent to one another, the reason they are together lies in something other than them. What is indifferent to many alternative ways of being needs something other than itself to make it adopt one of them. A pile of oak planks, for example, in itself is capable of receiving any of the thousand forms of furniture. It never assumes these forms of itself, however, but it requires them, uh, but it, acquires, I'm sure that is, them only through extrinsic causes. And why doesn't it assume those forms of itself? Because of its indifference to them all. It has need of a necessary, con it has need, probably it has need of a necessary connection to any of those forms. Boy, that has got messed up. That's not, that's not him, that's, that's a transcription, I'm sure. Uh, necessary connection to any of those forms, nor any active, uh, active tendency uh, toward them. I'm not sure what happened to that. that. That got butchered, and I can hunt it down, but it takes too long. Once the oak is in the form of a dining table, it becomes independent of the human cause who brought it into that form. Is the oak table from then on independent of all causes whatsoever? Is it now a self-existing thing? We must not forget the lesson of the snowball. If the table holds together at all, exhibiting some persistence in its new unity, there are unifying causes at work. Maybe screws, maybe nails, maybe pegs, maybe uh, design flanges. And they are causes of a kind that can exist and act independently of the table and that are working within the table, continuing its existence. These rules are not restricted to artifacts. They are quite general. Every disease is an example of a combination. To have cancer is not part of human nature. Otherwise, everyone would have it automatically and by definition. This cancer is found in this or that person because of something added to human nature by some cause or causes. Now, that's kind of semi-persuasive, um, except that there are hereditary cancers. Uh, there are hereditary tendencies to cancer where you can predict that somebody is more likely to have cancer than otherwise. For example, a woman with BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes is more likely to have breast cancer. Um, and so, now, to be fair, yes, that still has a cause. Um, I'm not pointing that out to say that I disagree with his idea that most things have causes. Um, and uh, we may have some discussion about a few apparent exceptions. Um, but... I say this because I think that it's fair to say that uh, the strength of the argument is only as strong as someone has 
the ability to believe that we stack up all these things and there must be a cause, and it's easier to believe that there is a cause for everything than it is that there's not a cause for everything. So basically, you're taking the first premi uh, premise on a fair amount of demonstration and a little bit of faith. So even though it's a deductive argument in the end, it's an inductive argument to get to the premise to begin with. Why is it that the four nucleotides, thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine, depend on a prior kangaroo or kangaroo cell in order to come together in the form of kangaroo DNA? Because these nucleotides, while capable of that particular arrangement, are equally capable of millions of others, and so in themselves, they're indifferent to them all. Now, interestingly, that's really kind of a design argument. And why do protons, neutrons, and electrons depend on so impressive a cause as a supernova, or else a particle accelerator, and certain specific processes in order to come together in the form of gold? Because they are capable of taking not only the form of gold, but also of lead, hydrogen, and so on, and therefore in themselves those basic particles are indifferent to all such forms. There is no need to multiply examples. We're multiplying examples. The general principle should be clear. It is not because of anything special about houses or kangaroos or chemical elements that they require prior causes to come into being and remain in it. It is because they all consist of combinations of things that are to some extent indifferent to their combination. And therefore, the first cause cannot be a combination of anything. Rigidity in a square or rectangle can be achieved only by adding bracing. Not so the rigidity of a triangle, which just belongs to the triangle itself, as a natural property of triangularity. So, the point he's making here is, the same property can sometimes belong to two different things, then, while depending on a cause in one case, but not in the other. So a property could be belong to a first cause and also belong to other causes. Um, but in one case it's necessary and in the other case it's not. The rigidity does depend on some causes though. It depends on the hardness of the wood, for example, and on a builder to put the angular shape into the wood in the first place. At first, it might seem that this is true without exception, and that any feature common to two things must belong to each through some kind of cause, even if not the same kind of cause. The form common to two pennies depends on the same kind of cause, a coining machine, to stamp it into the metal. Examples of the same kind of thing occur throughout nature. For now, it is enough to see that something, such as existence, might very well belong to one thing through special causes and to another through no causes at all. The rigidity of triangles is such a case. For sides of the quadrilateral are open to an infinity of shapes, that is, assuming we can bend the angles, and something outside them has to decide which ones they are to be. Any three sides that can form a triangle, however, decide the shape all by themselves why there is at most one first cause. Could there be two or more first causes if they are distinguished by being causes of different kinds of things in the universe? The two governors, and he's been talking about the governor of Maine and the governor of Arizona, have the same nature, human nature, but in addition, uh, but in different portions of matter. I, that, that was my insertion, by the way. I should have marked the insertion itself, although the words inside are his. Um, one in these materials here, the other in those there. Could our two gods differ like that? Could the common divine nature be stamped into two different parts of some receptive material, as it were? Imagine two pennies again. The form of a penny requires a cause to stamp it on a metal that is indifferent to it. Just so would the form of a god require a cause to impress it on a material that is indifferent to this being, to being this god or that one. There is a cause then, combining the nature of a god with the materials or features distinctive of a Zeus or an Athena or an Apollo. 
that is assuming that such people or gods exist. That was the rule about combinations needing combiners. It follows that whenever two things share a common nature and differ only by the addition of it to distinct hunks of some indifferent material, both will require prior causes. Neither of them can be a first cause. It is not possible to get two first causes by combining their common nature with something to which it is indifferent. Whether they are two pennies or two gods or two of anything else, there is only one way to get something. Uh, pardon me. There is one way to get something, but not a way to get two d two first causes. The combination of anything with something to which it is indifferent requires a prior cause, which knocks that combination out of the first clause. First cause club. Can we have two first causes in some other way without giving them a common nature? What if our first two causes were radically distinct things? For example, some kind of fundamental matter in a non material God. Would that work? Alas, it will not. Why not? Because even then they will have a common nature. Precisely because each one is supposed to be a first cause, each would have to possess at least the nature of a necessary self-existent thing. A first cause cannot drive its existence from something before it, and so it has its existence of itself. That is a special nature. Many natures, such as the natures of cats and dogs, cannot be such a thing. Anything that, just because of what it is, it is incapable of being produced by something else. We can say more, because a first cause must be self-existing, its nature cannot consist of things that might possibly be separate from each other, since in that case there would be some indifference between them, and so they would need a cause for them to be together. All these conditions for a necessarily self-existing thing, then, must be common to both our hypothetical first causes. Nor can that be the whole story. In order to keep our candidates distinct from each other, so they're not the same thing, we must suppose a positive distinguishing feature in at least one of them. For example, the material first cause would have dimensions, but the spiritual God would not. Or the God has an intelligence that is distinct from and added to its self-existent nature, whereas the matter does not have that. The distinguishing difference, whatever it is, cannot be something trivial since it is the only way for our two first causes to be two and not just one and the same thing. And there's a kicker. Their common nature exists with a distinctive feature in one case and without it in the other. The combination is therefore in itself indifferent to that add-on and hence enters into the combination with it only through a prior cause, a combiner. Whichever of our first causes possesses this different and is distinguished by it alone, therefore, has its distinct existence only through that prior cause, having provided it with its distinct feature, which rules it out as a first cause after all. Thus, there is simply no way to get more than one absolutely first cause. In summary, two first causes would share a common nature. They could best be distinguished only by some addition to that nature in at least one of them. That distinguishing addition, since the common nature is indifferent to it, would belong to its possessor through a cause. Therefore, the possessor of the distinguishing addition would not be a first cause after all. The force of these principles has decided our question for us. There cannot be two or more first causes. There is a single one at most. And now he's going to give three corollaries which immediately follow. The most obvious of these is that there is exactly one first cause which follows thus. There is at most one first cause. That's what we discussed last, uh, we just discussed. There's at least one first cause. That was what we discussed last week. And therefore, there is exactly one first cause. Another corollary is that all other things besides the first cause, whatever it is, have a cause of their being. There can be only one self-existing thing, as our reasoning has shown. 
All other things then have their existence of a continuous dependence uh, on a cause or causes. The third corollary is that all things besides the first cause derive their existence from it. Any other than the first cause has a cause of its being by our second corollary. If this cause, that cause is the first cause, then we're done. If that cause is not the first cause, then it has, also has a cause of its being, and this cause cannot, this cannot continue endlessly, <coughs> excuse me, according to the reasoning in chapter one. This must terminate in a first cause, but there's only one of these. Therefore, all beings derive, whether immediately or through many intermediate causes, from the one and only first cause. We should stop to congratulate ourselves. We've eliminated all but one thing as suspects in the great whodunit, that is, our search for the first cause. But there is still a long way to go. The conclusion that there is only one first cause of all things, and that it is the cause of the being of all other things we can name, does not yet move us beyond common ground with atheists and materialists. The reduction of all effects to a single first cause, matter, is the heart and soul of materialism, after all. The materialist view also fits with the idea that the first cause is responsible not only for things coming into existence, but for their continuing in existence as well. Nothing can exist even for a moment without the materials out of which it is made. Is some self-shaping matter, then, the first cause? The impossibility of that will come into view after another bend or two in the road. And now he's going to go after other... He's gotten to one first cause. Now he's going to go after what are properties of the first cause. And one of the things re he's promising is that it won't turn out to be matter. Some modern myths, I'm including this partly because of the argument and partly because it gives you a better perspective on, on uh, his way of looking at things, and partly because he's bringing up some interesting points. Intellectual history is haunted by certain myths. When I was in grade school, I was taught that Christopher Columbus was the first person to prove that the earth is round. I was also given to understand that until he made his famous voyage in 1492, nobody believed this crazy notion that the earth is anything but flat. He was alone in this scientific conviction. I learned too why ancient and medieval astronomers believed the earth was the center of the universe. <coughs> My teachers explained that before the advent of science, about 1492, uh, it was a common conviction that human beings have the most important things in the world, are, are, pardon me, that should be human beings are the most important things in the world, and therefore people naturally thought the boat of humanity should be at the center of the universe. It was also an elementary, in, in elementary school that I learned about Galileo. He was one of the he was the one who really got science going because he was the first person to propose checking our theories against experience. These ideas possess a certain charm, and while they fib, they also sprinkle in a few grains of truth. Perhaps that is why they persist. At any rate, they're more wrong, much more wrong than right. Well over a thousand years before Columbus, Ptolemy, to say nothing of his predecessors, gave very sound reasons for saying the earth was tolerably spherical and pretty much the entire educated world agreed on the point. His geocentrism, Ptolemy's geocentrism, had nothing to do with his belief in, the, in our pride of place as humans. In fact, he believed, like others of his time and long afterwards, that mankind belonged to the inferior realm of destructible things that by their very nature sink here to earth, the very pit of the world. And uh, in fact, to extend it even further, um, although he doesn't do this, it's worthwhile pointing out that the center of the earth contained hell. Galileo was by no means the first person to think experiments were useful. Another of these myths that would have it, that the ancient philosophers were all or all believers in immaterial souls and incorporeal deities, and that the history of human thought presents a more or less steady progress away from those primitive notions toward the materialism of modern science and philosophy. Nonsense. In both the East and the West, the most ancient philosophers thought the first cause was some sort of material underlying all things. Um, 
and I'm not sure how that sh got into there, but it's uh, with, uh, possessed with certain self-motive properties. And Thales talked about water. Uh, Anaximenes and Anaximander talked about air, or sometimes the indefinite. Heraclitus and Empedocles um, talked about fire and, ener and energy. And interestingly, if you were to take some of um, Heraclitus' statements on fire and substitute energy for it, uh, we would find ourselves, uh, at least the scientists would find themselves um, uh, nodding in agreement much of the time. And then there's the, the Tao. Or, um, and then finally there's Earth. The very word matter comes from the Latin mater or mother, the mother of all things. And of course, you have just now seen people arguing for fire, water, air, fire, and earth, which you may recognize as the four elements. In this general conception of a self-moving matter, we have our first serious candidate for the first cause of all things. But matter is not the first cause. And the reason why it is impossible for it to be so, matter is subject to motion. The first cause, um, on the other hand, is not. I don't know where that come came from. Oh, I know. Transcribed, transcribed causes come and I didn't erase it. Um, it cannot have any motion whatsoever. To see this takes more doing. Um, so every motion is the kind of thing that can exist only if something else exists, namely it's mobile. You see, the principle that things naturally stay still is now being used with a vengeance. Motion is a kind of change, and things that change have to have a cause of their change, and therefore um, that cannot be true of the first cause. It is not the sort of thing that can exist only if something else exists. It is a self-existing thing, the first cause. It is also true that the first cause cannot have emotion of any kind. This is a bit trickier to see. Since the first cause cannot be emotion, it follows conversely that every motion is something other than the first cause. But everything other than the first cause is an effect and is caused by the first cause, according to corollaries in chapter 2. Is the first cause a self-mover? And he would answer no. The thing about self-movers is that they necessarily have a minimum of two parts, one part moving the other. And of course, the first cause has to be a single thing, not a multiplicity of things. There simply is no way to get, to the, fir to get the first cause to have any motion. It can't even move itself. Because if it did, there would be change. This reasoning sounds the death knell, I'm sorry, that bad transcription, for the theory that matter is the first cause. Matter, energy, and fundamental particles are all subject to motion. The first cause is not. First implies unchangeable. The first cause, it, it must be that, the existence, that existence is necessary to its nature and non-existence is simply impossible to it, for it. And you may see arguments on an occasion that, 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 uh, that uh, necessity requires a first cause, requires a God. The first cause of all things can neither be created nor destroyed. Well, that sounds a lot like matter cannot be created or destroyed, or energy cannot be created or destroyed, doesn't it? You know, it's an interesting question to ask at this point. Was the first law of thermodynamics a philosophical law, rather originally, that got caught up in, uh, in empiricism? Why the first cause cannot have dimensions, he will explain that. 
Nothing gives what it does not have. Now, this is an interesting phrase. And what's interesting to me is that he uses it in this context, and he doesn't use it in other contexts, um, where uh, the first cause must have change within itself then, because otherwise it couldn't give change. But I digress. He talks about the supreme being. So first cause must, be, uh, must exist, but it does not have dimensions. Defects or deficiencies are not really actu actualities existing in the world as much as absences of actualities that could but don't exist in certain places and things. And here you can see uh, the, um, the beginnings of an argument that, that evil doesn't actually exist. It's actually a, an absence of good. And if you remember back a few, a um, couple months ago, you may remember that that was originally expressed uh, by Hahn and Rotz. And uh, one of the things I pointed out to him is that's not really an adequate explanation for evil. That evil is actually more like twisted good than it is like uh, absence of good. Uh, he talks about bad design. If the intermediate causes are not infallible, uh, pardon me, yeah, if they are detectable, then we might blame them rather than the first clause for any flaws we find or think we find. I think or think we find is important because a lot of times we think that uh, we could do better and in fact we can't. But I think that the other point that he's making there is that the intermediate causes might be blamed instead of the first cause for, for a truly bad design. Now, the problem I have with that is that in that case, couldn't the uh, first cause may have made better intermediate causes? So uh, I'm, n I'm not sure that you can pass it off quite as easily as that. And then he, he argues that the, intelli that the first cause has intelligence. Not exactly our kind of intelligence, but an intelligence. Um, it follows that the natural world and everything in it is truly the product of understanding and intention. The ubiquitous appearance of design from the lowest... Whoa! Now we're getting arguments from design. From the lowest laws of physics to the highest living things is no mere appearance, no grand illusion. It is simply the truth. Long before they came into being, eyes were meant for seeing, ears were meant for hearing. And the world was meant to produce living beings with eyes and ears. And the world was meant to be seen and heard. And this remains true whether eyes are irreducibly compact, cl complex components or not. And that last phrase, I think he's trying to allow himself not to be caught uh, with, uh, oh, but this isn't intelligently designed and therefore your argument uh, gets ruined. What he's saying is the sheer fact that, it, that they exist mean that they were intended. Uh, giving mind a new meaning. Uh, the harmony of the beautiful and the intelligible. And then beauty in our universe, it bears every sign of, an eff of being an effect, a work. One might even say an expression. And uh, then he says, by the way, there is a God. We've all run into the question, who made God? If instead someone asked what, beca what became, whoa, sorry about that. What, uh, what caused the first cause? That's what it should say. The illegitimacy of the question would be obvious at once. It's like what's ask, asking what's north of the North Pole. Um, for their part, Dawkins and others like him have no proof that all intelligence must be brain-based. Why, it isn't even clear in our own case that our brain is actually doing our understanding. And here you can see him arguing for 
a mind that's independent of the brain. And by the way, he may be right on that particular argument. Now, I've outlined that, uh, that uh, he's established that when there's at most one first cause, which means there's only one cause, and that uh, that cause does not have dimensions, and that cause does have a mind of some kind, uh, and that that cause uh, uh, is not matter. And I am sympathetic to the goal of what he's doing. I, I think he's right about that. I am concerned about the means by which he gets there. Um, as I pointed out last week, I'm reminded that philosoph philosophia, the Greek word for philosophy, is used only once in scripture, and that's Colossians 2.8 in the English translation, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And what's even more interesting with that text is that the basic principles of the world, the stoicheia to cosmu, as the Greek reads, are actually thought by many to mean the four elements of the earth. So he is tying it directly into, uh, at least if that interpretation is correct, he's tying it directly into Greek philosophy. Thomas Aquinas, and especially Aristotle, appear dated, and not, not just dated, but uh, in fact, uh, don't have the best insight into how the world is put together. Um, I am concerned about a God who appears to be unmoved by our choices. Uh, I am concerned that the definition of God as the unmoved mover may compromise the doctrine of the Trinity. How, how do you get a Trinity out of uh, something that's only one? Um, I'm concerned with how we, how we reconcile the unmoved mover with the humanity of Jesus. And in fact, this is not just my own concern. This was a historical concern in Christianity. And you can follow the church councils wrestling with this very question. Uh, I am concerned about what ha appears to me to be the inconsistent use of nothing can give what it does not have. It means that God must have everything inside of him, including all the bad stuff, if you take it to its logical conclusion. And it's interesting that, that uh, Algros and, and I think many others like him, I don't think he's alone in this, otherwise I wouldn't have bothered with him, um, has... Uh, uses it in some instances and then not in others. Um, does God then have to have potentiality? Well, he would say no, he doesn't have potentiality, but then how can you give that? Can, how can a God who doesn't have dimensions give in dimensions? How can a God, well, maybe intelligence is not a good example, but, uh, but brains certainly are. How can a God who doesn't have brains, give brains. I am concerned that the philosophy does not appear to have learned anything significant from science. And the next time, which either next week or the week after that we uh, take this up again, uh, I'm going to go over that because I think that it's really important to understand the weaknesses of this kind of an approach. Um, and finally, I'm concerned that circular causation is brushed off way too easily. Uh, as I pointed out last week, planet A is keeping planet B in orbit, while planet B is keeping planet A in orbit, both of them being pulled in the opposite directions, both of them ascribing a circle. This appears to be literally circular causation, or perhaps elliptical causation in some cases, except for whoever made the law of gravity and keeps it in force. Each planet gives its corresponding planet the exact opposite force of what it is receiving. And so it looks like we have reciprocal causation. If gravity is too mysterious, just imagine two large balls with a chain between them rotating around in space, and they will keep each other in circular orbits. Uh, the size of those orbits depending on the relative weights of the balls and the chain. 
Each ball pulls on its counterpart by means of the chain and keeps it moving in a circular path. It seems that we have, at this point, exactly circular causation. And the question is, does that destroy the argument that he's making? It would seem like it might, at least certainly from a, from a we know everything is A, that is A is B, we show that this is A, and therefore this must be B. Well, if everything that is A is not necessarily B, then you can't make that logical jump. You are now arguing on probabilities. You are arguing on induction, if you please. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Just a minute, so we can uh, hear what you're saying. So this is almost a masterpiece of absurdity. See nothing convincing. Well, the, the thing that's interesting is, is at one point, it was the very best that we had to offer. It and, doesn't make it good. And so I want to be careful about saying it's absurd, but I do think that with further, with further experiment, experience, that we can say that it is probably wrong. Uh, there was a time when philosophy tried who, to who deduce put probability. In it? Yeah, there was a time when philosophy tried to deduce everything from first principles. And the fact of the matter is, we have a hard time figuring out what those first principles really should be. Or I think will we ever understand it? And I think that's, that's the big weakness of this. It's not so much in the deduction itself. Deduct deduction, if you give the premises, the conclusion follows. The problem is, uh, are we Trust really justified? Me, he, he can't keep up with his own logic. He doesn't even know where he's going sometimes. He uh, reasons around in circles. Well, I think he does know where he's going. It's just that well, I'm he not thinks he knows where he's going. I, I'm not sure that where he's going is something that includes all of the real world. Yeah, I just and wouldn't that, give him that much credit. That's the difference that I would make. I, like I say, if you give the premises, the conclusion does follow. The question is, should we be giving the premises? We agree with the idea of there being a first cause. Yeah. But yes. But I guess where it's going to break down is then explaining how God got here. So that's, you know, we just have to throw our hands up at that point. I don't know. Yeah. I, well, I mean, I mean we, I, can, we can go with all this, but, but you still get stuck at that point and, and then it breaks down. You know, actually, if you're looking at it from a Trinitarian point of view, the real God is God, the Holy Spirit. The Father and the Son have locations in, in, in space, and so they can't be the real God. <laughs> you see, the Holy Spirit doesn't have dimensions, and so therefore that, that would actually work. And that's, see, that's, that's one of the things that I think that uh, hasn't been wrestled with enough. It is is... If you're going to go this route, well, first of all, can you be absolutely confident that it is true? And the, and the second thing is that what does it do to other Christian doctrines? And, and you can watch councils fighting this, you know, uh, well, God must be, a, uh, Jesus must be a lesser God because he can't be really fully God. Well, why can't he be? Partly because of, you know, his subordinates and subordination means that there's, you know, that, that's not really God. But partly because of the insistence that God is the first cause, and therefore Jesus just isn't quite there. And the councils basically, basically they said, no, no, it doesn't work that way. We don't understand how it works, but it... it you know, Jesus has two natures, one a divine nature which is infinite, one a human nature which is not infinite, and somehow they both are united together. Well, from a philosophical standpoint, from an Aristotelian viewpoint, 
That was nonsense. You see, because the God nature doesn't have dimensions, is purely simple, can't be combined with anything else, and this is like trying to pretend that oil and water will mix nicely. You know, the, the problem with that is that Trinity isn't mentioned in the Bible. It's a human concept that's come from reading the Bible. Um, my idea of what the Trinity is and what your idea of what it is, is it could be completely different. But you can't well, really go to the Bible different. and figure out which one is right. And I would mostly agree with that. The, the, the problem is that when you start talking about the, the, uh, uh, the humanity of Jesus and its relationship to his divinity, was he really human? Was he really divine? I, the old Gnostic um, heresy was that, well, Jesus was not really... God took over Jesus and then he left him in Gethsemane. Yeah, but that's all an idea. We, when you get human and God together, you got two parts coming together. I mean, how do you get a trinity from that? Well, I, I, I'm not even... God I, and man. Here's, here's the thing. I, I, can, I can easily see a person arguing that the trinity is not... Uh, is not something that we really understand well. And that there are places where they seem to be united and there are places where they seem to be separate. At Jesus' baptism, God speaks, the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove, and there's Jesus, and it looks like you have three separate entities. On the other hand, they appear to be working together in a number of different ways, in, in ways that, that look almost identical. But then Jesus goes up to the right hand of the Father. Well, you, you see, it's hard enough with, with modern conceptions. It's really difficult with the conception of this God that doesn't even have dimensions, does not have a presence anywhere. See, and, and this, is the, uh, this is the theological problem that has occupied Christianity for literally millennia. It's also a scientific problem, too. It is a scientific because problem. Because you can't use science to prove God. Uh, not, certainly not in this way. Not in this way, but, but um, I don't know. It's, when I look at the Trinity personally, I just look at one God with three different names. Three different names having an emphasis of a certain aspect of that same God. That's the way I look at it. Now, I heard you say that, while well, you were explaining there, that, that, well, does everything come from God because everything's in God? To me, that's, I would say yes. Be I don't know how it is, but he is the source of everything. And so, see, it just depends how you but look see, at it but is, see, that is how you're going to come up with a trinity. But see, that means that God contains everything in him, including evil. Well, that's the other thing. Is bad, is all bad evil? Now, so, now you've got a circular argument going. No, no. You've got to define your terms. Well, I, would, I would say that, you know, God, to me, God has to operate on certain principles for it for him to exist. So he can't violate certain principles or, or, or even he will break down. So now to say, that, well, so what was the cause of those first principles before God or it's just all in one package or what? See, so I don't know how we're gonna have a conversation on this and come to any conclusions. You know, it's, it's Well, and, and the problem is that, number one, I think that we're dealing with insufficient evidence because we don't really yeah. know. All we can do is hypothesize and hope that it, what we say makes reasonable sense. But two, I'm not sure we have even the concepts that, that need to be understood in order to make this work. I mean, everything we have contact with has a beginning. So to discuss something that has no beginning, 
we have no premises to, to even approach it. You know, infinitude, infinitude, infinitude. That's, that's what we are. I mean, even what you're arguing there. Yeah. <laughs> As we have comment here. I wish my mom was here. She would remember the verse. I think it was Isaiah, but I don't, don't remember for sure now. But anyway, there's, there's some verses where God basically says that he called himself into existence. And so he does, in, in the scripture, claim what, what the gentleman is claiming, that God definitely admits that he is self-existent, he is the beginning. Well, he, you don't even have to go that far. If you go, if you go to uh, the famous re revelation of Moses uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the burning bush, he says, "I am what I am." You know. And that's because of how much we can understand. That's right. That's why it's such a good name. Yeah. And, I and, am and, what I am. And interestingly enough, uh, the word uh, Yahweh happens to be dead ringer for the third person singular, Hifil, of the verb to be, uh, Hayah. So that the claim of, uh, to use the anglicized version Jehovah, is actually that he causes to be. So in a word, you could actually cause, call that the first cause. Uh, you know, I'm actually comfortable with where he ends up except that I'm not sure that we can take the kinds of reasoning that he's using to ascribe to God various properties or not. We've, you know, to, I, I think you can say he's not material, but I do think that um, to say that he's, uh, and he's, he's probably beyond dimension in a certain sense, but he's chosen to reveal himself in dimensions. That's one of the lessons of the incarnation of Jesus, is that there is actually, uh, that God can kind of step into time and space. It's almost as if the creator of a video game were to put himself in as an avatar. This, uh, I'm sure that's... To me, this all seems like mind games to me. <laughs> well, and, and, and one of the things that I think that, um, that Agros, and, and people like him, there are a lot of people like him that I've run into, um, don't realize is that when you first hear it, it sounds good until you start picking at the edges and you start realize that it's not it's not quite as secure as you thought. And um, I guess one of the things I'll be doing fairly soon is to show you some of the, uh, well, where this fits into the philosophy of science and how I think that, uh, and you, you can disagree, but we'll see, how I think that, uh, that science should be done and how I think that theology should be done in a, in a fairly similar way, just with different material. Uh, and that there is a unity, but it is a unity more on the scientific model than it is on the old Aristotelian model. I think the Aristotelian model actually won't hold up under close scrutiny. But that's for another time. <laughs>